Hey you, thanks for clicking on the video. Welcome to the channel. This is my first video and I wanted to do a topic that was straightforward and had no conspiracies involved. Without further ado, I present to you the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. I peeked right in front of that uh, Texas bookstore depository and I saw everything that happened. I didn't shoot anybody, no, sir. From Dallas, Texas, the flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. John F. Kennedy was the 35th President of the United States. Now, if you were around during that time, you would know how big of a deal JFK actually was. The nation went from this to this. One thing to note about JFK is that he was a people person. He would go out into the crowds, and he would shake hands, he would talk to people. Now obviously, his Secret Service detail, not a big fan of this, probably for obvious reasons, we'll get to in a little bit. Now, let's jump into Lee Harvey Oswald. Oswald, the soon-to-be assassin of JFK, was an interesting character, to say the least. He was a Marine, for one, but he was actually discharge so they could take care of his mother as her health was kind of failing. However, soon after being discharged from the Marines, Oswald defected to the Soviet Union. We can kind of attribute his interest in Russian history and philosophy and art to this. Now, after getting to the Soviet Union, it turns out that Oswald, a self-described communist, wasn't a fan of the gray drab atmosphere, the bread lines, and what he hated most was the lack of nighttime activities, if you catch my drift. Soon after arriving to the Soviet Union, Oswald was already on his way back to the United States with a new wife in tow named Marina and an infant daughter named June. Now, as soon as Oswald returned to the United States, he was a target of the FBI, obviously. Now, th this was mostly due to his continuing communist activities in the States once he returned. For instance, he uh, took off to New Orleans to live for a bit. And while he was there, he started a communist like chapter or tried to. Didn't really go anywhere, but the FBI was not very happy with this. It also didn't help that two months before the assassination, Oswald took off to Mexico City. And while he was there, he allegedly visited the Soviet Union and Cuban embassies. And if you know about anything about history, at this time, Cuba and the Soviet Union, you know, weren't the best friends with the United States. Now, after moving around quite a few cities, Oswald finally settled with his wife and child in the town of Irving, Texas. Oswald would finally get a job in October of 1963 at a little known place called the Texas School Book Depository in Dallas. So jumping forward to the day of the shooting, Kennedy arrives in Dallas on November 22nd, 1963. So the reason Kennedy was actually in Dallas at this time was to settle some disputes within the Democratic Party in Texas. Uh, a split had actually caused a Republican to get elected, which at that time had not happened in a very long time. Also on the list of activities was a motorcade through Dallas, where he would be sitting with the current governor, John Connolly, and his wife. As soon as Kennedy, his wife Jacqueline, and his vice president, Lyndon Johnson, touched down in Dallas, Kennedy and Jacqueline, you know, being the people's president and first lady, immediately go out and meet the crowds, which thousands of people had gathered at that point, to go shake hands, talk to people. And someone actually gave Jacqueline a dozen roses, which was Actually pretty cool. Now, Kennedy's security detail, obviously not a fan of this because, you know, you never know what psychopath has a gun out there. <laughs> oh, they also weren't big fans of the entire route being published in local newspapers days before. Now, waiting at the airport for the Kennedys and Vice President Johnson is the current governor of Texas, John Connolly, and his wife, Nellie. They were already in the car that they were going to be riding in to go on this motorcade throughout Dallas. And needless to say, Kennedy's Secret Service detail also weren't a big fan of the car. It was a 1961 Lincoln Continental Convertible. Of course, top down. It was the perfect car to be assassinated. I mean, 
take a stroll through downtown in. Kennedy and his wife get into the back seat of this convertible. So to kind of give a representation of what this car looked like, it was modified. So there was the front driver's seat. There was a middle row, which was added in. And then there was a back row. So Kennedy and his wife get in the back row. Connolly and his wife get in the middle row. And then two Secret Service agents get in the front row with one of them driving, obviously. And how they were sitting, it was the president and then the governor, the first lady, and then uh, the, the governor's wife. Okay, so we know what Kennedy was up to the day of the shooting, right? But what about Oswald? Oswald, by all accounts, to be honest with you, was kind of a dick. No one really liked him, especially people who worked with him. Sorry, that was my cat. And he also had a very interesting, but I guess pretty common work schedule at the time. So like I said earlier, he lived in Irving, Texas, but he worked in Dallas, Texas. And those two are about 45 minutes apart. So what Oswald would do is rent a rooming house in Dallas, which you can think of it like a modern day Airbnb where he would stay throughout the week when he worked. But then on the weekends, he would hitch a ride with a coworker and neighbor, Wesley Frazier, to, you know, be like, hey, Wesley, you know, take me back to Irving on Friday and then bring me back up on Monday. And, you know, he was totally cool with it. But the week of the assassination was kind of odd. So the day of the shooting was a Friday. That Thursday after work, Oswald went up to Frazier and he's like, hey, man, can I get a ride back to Irving? Frazier's like, okay, kind of weird, but I'll let you ride with me, whatever. So on Friday morning, when Frazier and Oswald are, you know, hanging back to Dallas to go to work, Oswald brought something very odd with him that day. It was a long sack. And when Frazier is like, you know, hey, what's in that sack? Oswald's like, oh, Kern rods. And Frazier's like, okay. Very odd, but what are you going to do? I guess the guy wanted to redesign his rooming house. Oh, and remember that bag of Kern rods. It comes up later. Another fun fact, before Oswald left that morning, he left cash and his wedding ring on the dresser in his room. So yeah, a little weird. Okay, so jumping back to Kennedy. The motorcade leaves the airport. Uh, I believe it was Love Field. And they start on this 10 mile route through all of Dallas. The end of this route was supposed to end at the uh, Dallas Trademark, where Kennedy was supposed to give a luncheon. Unfortunately, the president would never make it here. The vast majority of this motorcade goes smoothly. There are people lined all up and down the streets of Dallas to see the president and the first lady. I'm sure there might've been some Connolly people there, you know, like, hey, go governor. But I mean, who cares about the governor, right? You're there to see the president. The motorcade makes its way down Main Street in Dallas. It goes down five or six blocks. It makes a right on the Houston Street, goes about a block, and it makes a left on the Elm Street. Everything is fine until the unthinkable happens. Three shots are fired at the motorcade. The first shot completely misses. The second shot though, we didn't get as lucky. The bullet actually entered through Kennedy's neck in the back here, and it actually came out the front, right about here. You can see in the Sapruder film, which we'll get to, Kennedy's kind of doing this. That's because he just been shot through the throat. But, and this is kind of like a what if scenario. Some doctors believe that if this had been the only shot Kennedy took, he would have been fine. He would have lived, might have been a long recovery, but ultimately history would have gone down a lot different. The second bullet actually ricochets out of Kennedy's neck, goes in front of him, hits the governor who is sitting right in front of Kennedy in the chest, and then somehow ricochets and hits the governor in the leg. This is also called the magic bullet theory, something Connolly was not a big fan of in the coming years. And then the third shot rings out. This is the shot that actually kills the president. It hits Kennedy right here in the head. And if you have the stomach for it, go watch the Zapruder film and you see, you literally see Kennedy's head explode. It's pretty violent, it's pretty gory. At this moment, all hell 
breaks loose. Everyone on the street is just on the ground, you know, hoping not to get shot. Jackie Kennedy is actually jumping on the back of the vehicle to try to, from what it looks like, she's trying to get off. But there might be, I sound kind of wrong, actually. She's trying to get away from the vehicle. But a Secret Service agent who was walking behind the vehicle jumps up onto the back of the convertible, somehow shimmies his way up, even though the car is speeding away. And he holds the first lady, holds her down, and they take off to the nearest hospital, which is Parkland Hospital. It's 12.30 p.m. and Oswald is standing on the sixth floor window of the southeast corner of the Texas School Book Depository. He had just effectively killed the President of the United States. Though we will never know his exact thoughts or what was going through his head at this time, I have two scenarios. The first, holy shit, I just killed the President. And not in a good way. He is terrified. He doesn't know what to do. He's just standing there. The other, holy shit, I just killed the President. I hope someone was filming that. Spoiler alert, they were. And I don't know, maybe he was like Fortnite emoting around. I, I don't know. Also, one more thing I want to put out there that is just a really mind-blowing fact about this that isn't really brought up too often. Oswald was 24 years old when he assassinated the president. I'm 24 years old and I'm standing here making YouTube videos. Now, I'm not trying to like glorify Oswald and him murdering somebody, but it, it, to me, it's crazy. It's like, I, I don't know. It's just, it's just an interesting observation. Anyway, regardless of what was running through his mind at the time, we know what actions he took next. He took his rifle, which was a bolt action Carcano Model 38, and he hid it under some boxes where he had shot from. He makes his way down the rear stairwell of the building, opens a door, and he is face to face with a Dallas police officer. This officer, Marion Baker, is actually speaking with Oswald's supervisor, Roy Truly. And the officer kind of stops Oswald. He's like, hey, you know, where'd you come from? Truly's like, uh, uh-uh, this guy works for me. It's all good. Officer's like, okay, go on through. And the officer and Truly proceed to go up to the sixth floor of the building. Now, after escaping narrowly, Oswald walks right out the front door of the Texas School Book Depository. After committing probably the most iconic crime of the 20th century, Oswald then catches a bus, but he's only on the bus for a few blocks and he decides to get off because of the heavy traffic due to the motorcade and the commotion of the assassination. He is somehow able to hail a taxi at this bus stop and he takes the taxi back to his rooming house. So he goes into the room, puts on a jacket, walks out, and it's only one o'clock PM, 30 minutes after he assassinated the president. Now, it is also about this time when Roy Truly's like, hmm, we're missing somebody. Where's Oswald? You know, the communist who hates America, who, you know, hates JFK, who went to the Soviet Union and defected for a while. Where's that guy at? Well, about this time, Officer Baker, probably realizing that he let the shooter go, puts out an alert for Oswald with the following description. Five foot four, white male, about late 20s, early 30s, wearing a white t-shirt. If you've seen any footage from the 1960s, that describes pretty much every male during that time. After grabbing his jacket and leaving the rooming house, Oswald just starts walking down the street. We don't know why Oswald just started walking. All we know is that he did. He started walking and about 20 minutes later, about 1.20, 1.30 PM, an officer by the name of JD Tippett sees Oswald walking down the street. Now Tippett knows this alerts out for this man. Oswald matching the description kind of prompts Tippett to be like, all right, we should probably stop this guy. Tippett rolls down his window and he yells for Oswald. He's like, hey, come here. Oswald's like, okay, walks up to Tippett's car, pulls out a 38 revolver from his jacket and fires it five times. One of the bullets completely misses. The other three hit Tippett in the chest and the fourth hits him right in the temple, killing him instantly, obviously. Oswald has now committed his second murder of the day. He kind of learns from his mistake at the Texas School Book Depository because he books it out of there. He doesn't wait around. He doesn't try to hide his evidence or doesn't do anything. He just books it out of there. No pun intended. Now, lucky for Oswald, a few blocks down the road, there was a theater called the Texas Theater, which cool name, I guess. 
Anyway, Oswald is able to, in his mind, sneak into the theater unnoticed. Unbeknownst to him though, a store manager from across the street actually sees Oswald sneak into the theater. So he walks over to the theater attendant and is like, hey, this guy just snuck into your theater. We should probably call the cops. And the theater attendant's like, okay. So the president's motorcade is speeding down the highway. Everyone in the vehicle, obviously still in shock, is attempting to stabilize the president and the governor, give them aid, whatever they can do in this moment to keep the president of the free world alive. Within eight minutes of the shooting, around 12.40 p.m.-ish, they arrived at Parkland Hospital. So Kennedy is rushed in, and I believe he is put into trauma room number one, and doctors go to work trying to save his life. At this point, though, he was just doing what they call a gonal breathing, which is you're, you're dead, but your body is still kind of going through the motions of trying to keep your organs running, trying to keep your heart pumping. And by 1 o'clock p.m., the president is declared deceased. Some interesting things do occur at the hospital that I would be amiss not to note. First, Jacqueline Kennedy actually walks up to the main doctor operating on Kennedy. And by the way, she's standing in the room while they do this, so she would not leave aside. She walks up to the doctor, reaches out her hand, and gives the doctor a piece of Kennedy's skull. Now this goes back to when the shooting happened and she was jumping on the back of the vehicle. Some people have put forward that the reason she did that was to actually grab this piece of skull fragment. I'm of the opinion that it was just shock and it was probably her sense of survival kicking in her caveman brain in a way. And her objective was to get out of that area as quickly as possible. But regardless, she gives him a piece of the president's skull and she waits by his side all throughout the procedures, even after his death. Also during this time, she has a very calm demeanor. You would think that a woman who just witnessed her husband's head being pretty much blown off would be, you know, erratic. That would be my reaction if I watched someone I love die in front of me. But with her, she was very calm very kind and she kept this demeanor all the way through the visit to parkland um, the president's body being taken back to washington dc the funeral all of it and then probably the most interesting thing to happen at parkland is that the coroner for dallas county his name was earl rose he shows up and is like hey you guys aren't taking his body anywhere because at this time the president had been declared deceased the Secret Service had gotten a coffin, they've put him in the coffin, and they're wheeling him out of Parkland. But Earl Rose is like, nah, you're not leaving. This man died in Dallas. His autopsy will happen in Dallas. The reason this interaction even took place between Earl Rose and the Secret Service is due to the weird federal laws at the time. It's hard to understand now, but at this time, a president had not been assassinated in 50, 60 years. There were no federal laws to say, hey, if the president dies, that's a federal crime. At the time, what Lee Harvey Oswald did was murder, but it was a murder in Dallas County, therefore within the jurisdiction of Dallas County. And therefore, his autopsy should take place in Dallas County. The Secret Service, um, not really in the mood to deal with Earl Rose's bullshit, literally just wheel JFK's body outside, pushing Earl Rose and a Dallas police officer out of the way. So nothing really happened with it, but Earl Rose really came under a lot of fire uh, for this move. People saw him as a bureaucrat who couldn't read the room correctly. And honestly, the whole Parkland fiasco, um, you know, the removal of JFK's body from the facility, the coffin they got, the interaction, the conflict they had with Earl Rose, that could be its own video. And there was a great one put out by the mortician lady, I believe is her name. I will put it in the description below. It's a great video and it's a deep dive into how Kennedy's body was, I guess, taken care of during his time at Parkland and after the fact. 
And by day's end, Kennedy's body was flown back to Washington, D.C., and Lyndon Johnson was sworn in as the 36th president of the United States. So back to Oswald. Only a few minutes after the theater attendant called the police, Officer Nick McDonald arrives on scene. And it's funny to think about this, but McDonald was probably completely unaware that he was about to make the greatest arrest of the 20th century, in my opinion. The lights in the theater are turned on, and McDonald approaches Oswald, who is sitting in one of the rows. Oswald looks at McDonald and says probably the best thing that any innocent person could ever say, which is, well, it's all over now. Oswald then reaches into his jacket and pulls out the 38 revolver, points it at Officer McDonald, and pulls the trigger. This time, though, the gun doesn't fire. That's because the hammer of the revolver came down be in the webbing between McDonald's index finger and thumb, which is crazy to think about. He came that close to probably dying, but then McDonald kind of gets payback. He hits Oswald as hard as he can, disarms him, throws him on the floor, and arrests him. Oswald is then transferred to the Dallas police headquarters. Around 7 p.m. that evening, Oswald is formally charged in the murder of Officer J.D. Tippett. Around 1 a.m. on November 23rd of 1963, Oswald is formally charged with the murder of President John F. Kennedy. And, you know, <laughs> kind of a funny story, I guess. Oswald is walking down the hallway in this police department, and reporters have just flooded in. I mean, you can look at the video, and there's tons of them. They all ask him the same question. You know, all, Mr. Oswald, you know, did you kill the president? Did you kill the president? <laughs> His response is, oh my God, the president is dead? Like, okay, dude, really? Come on. So now we're gonna get into the aftermath of the shooting. Kennedy is formally laid to rest on November 26th of 1963. His body was supposed to be in an open casket, but reconstruction at that time for bodies wasn't the best. Like I mentioned earlier, um, Caitlin Daughtery, I think is how you say her name, did an amazing video on JFK's body like after the fact how they tried to reconstruct his face but it was just a weird like what's that called when something is like so real it looks off it's trying to look human ah the uncanny valley it was a very uncanny valley effect with what they did with Kennedy's body so he was actually laid to rest in a closed casket they took him to Arlington and buried him next to two of his infant children. They lit an internal flame, which is still going to this day. And, and just to add on to this, this is kind of like my ad-libbing here. It's crazy to think about what, what could have been different if JFK didn't die, you know? What if Oswald didn't read the papers, right? And know that JFK was, you know, gonna be right next to his building. We know for a fact that Oswald knew JFK's motorcade route, but it's just interesting. What if he didn't get the paper that week? What if instead of turning right on the Houston street, they turn left? Or, or what if Oswald just stayed in the Soviet Union? What could have been different? Because the next president, Lyndon Johnson, which I may do a video about, I'm not sure yet, not very popular. I mean, we, we saw the escalation of war in Vietnam. Um, we saw civil unrest and really would have been too much different with Kennedy? I for one think so, but that's just my opinion. Now Oswald's ending wasn't you know too much better. For two straight days, he is interrogated heavily. I mean, they are like hammering into him. What do you know? Why did you kill the president? Why did you kill Tippett? And he, he won't cave. The guy is just saying, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. Wasn't me, sorry, you got the wrong guy even though all evidence points to Oswald doing it. Now, this all comes to an end on November 24th of 1963. Oswald is actually being transported from the Dallas uh, police headquarters to the Dallas County Jail. And while he is being transported, there is a, a media circus going on. I mean, you have people filming, wa you know, waiting for Oswald to step out. Finally, he is let out um, in, ch you know, in handcuffs, surrounded by police officers, and again, the unthinkable happens. A man by the name of Jack Ruby, who was a local nightclub owner, steps out, pulls out a gun, points it at Oswald, 
shoots him once in the chest, killing Oswald. Um, Jack Ruby is then tackled and he is arrested and that's a whole other thing. But in a, in a weird, weird twist of fate, Oswald is also taken to Parkland and Earl Rose finally gets that autopsy that he always wanted. So now we have some loose ends to tie up. First, how did Oswald bring a gun to work and no one know? Remember back whenever I mentioned Oswald had a big sack with him and Wesley Frazier is like, hey, what's in that sack? And Oswald's like, oh, kern rods. Yeah, those weren't kern rods. That was Oswald's bolt action rifle. Now, how do we know for certain that three bullets were fired and Jackie Kennedy tried to run, you know, tried to jump out of the vehicle or tried to get a piece of her husband's skull, whatever her reason may be. How do we know all this? Well, a man by the name of Abraham Zapruder was in attendance on Elm Street during the motorcade. Zapruder had a, at the time, not common video camera and was filming the entire motorcade. He got the assassination all on film. And wow, I, I mean, the odds of getting it on film that long ago are so low. Now, I won't show the entire Sapruder film on this video. You, you've seen clips throughout the video of it, and that's because it's very graphic. Like I mentioned before, you literally see Kennedy's head explode. If you have the stomach for it, feel free to look it up. It is on YouTube. It's been like upscaled to 4K. There's a VR version, um, all sorts of crazy stuff. Just watch it if you have the stomach. It is really the most important video of the 20th century, in my humble opinion. Oh, and another fun fact about Oswald, his murder was also caught on film, but it was live. So Oswald actually was the first person to be murdered on live television in US history. So yeah, there's that. Now, as of the filming of this video, John F. Kennedy was the last president to be assassinated. There, of course, have been other attempts made, most notably on Ronald Reagan in 1981, I believe. That one was also caught on tape, but thankfully, Reagan survived that one. Or not thankfully, if you don't like Reagan. Now, of course, you can't talk about the Kennedy assassination without mentioning conspiracy theories, right? The most famous of all of these is probably the Grassy Knoll shooter. This theory states that there was a second shooter on the Grassy Knoll on Elm Street. The Grassy Knoll was a big, like, hedge, like a, a, a grass hedge thing. I don't know how to describe it. Where many people who were there during the assassination said they heard a gunshot ring out from. However, no evidence has come forward of a Grassy Knoll shooter yet. However, a lot of researchers and historians kind of point to the sound echoing off the surrounding buildings as the reason why people heard a shot coming from a different area. So my personal favorite conspiracy theory is that J.D. Tippett was hired by the mob to kill Oswald, which doesn't make too much sense to me. I mean, okay, granted, anything's possible, I guess. But J.D. Tippett had the jump on Oswald. I mean, he literally could just shot this guy without saying like, hey, you come here, right? He could have just been like, bam, bam, you're dead. You know, wham, blam, you're dead. And no one would have batted an eye because this man just murdered the president of the United States. This one falls flat for me. Um, some people bring up Tippett had mob ties but I mean, it was the 1960s, so I guess, you know, who didn't have mob ties back then? There's also the conspiracy that Oswald was set up by the CIA to assassinate Kennedy. Whenever we get into the whole, this government conspiracy plotted with this civilian to kill the president, I, I kind of, I don't know, I don't understand it personally. It's like what Ben Franklin said, three people can keep a secret if two of them are underground and dead. I just don't believe that there's this massive conspiracy in the government to kill JFK. My thoughts on this? Oswald acted alone, and it was a crime of opportunity. Think of it from Oswald's perspective. You are a staunch communist who 
hates capitalism, who hates America and what it stands for. And the man who represents all of that is driving by your front door. What are you going to do? To me, it just makes too much sense. And if this was a conspiracy and they wanted this to succeed, why would you kill Kennedy where you killed him? And my point is this. Before turning on to Elm and Houston, the motorcade was on a straight stretch down Main Street in Dallas. Why would you not post up in one of those buildings and shoot him on the straight stretch, which gives you a better chance to actually kill the president? I really do think it's as simple as Oswald had the opportunity. He was trained to do this in the military, and he did it. What's more interesting is that even though Oswald wasn't around to see this, his actions led to more hatred, more social outcry against communism than leaving Kennedy alive would have ever produced, in my opinion. I mean, we went to Vietnam. I mean, you know, thousands upon thousands of Americans died for a war machine that just generated profit for rich people and nothing ever came of it. And this seems to be a almost repeating theme in American history because for instance, when John Wilkes Booth assassinated President Lincoln, he did it because he wanted the South to rise again. He didn't want the war to end because he was afraid of what the North would do to the South. By all accounts, Lincoln would have been very forgiving of the South. He wouldn't have punish them. But by Booth killing Lincoln, Lincoln's vice president, Andrew Johnson, which another interesting tidbit, last name Johnson, last name Johnson for Kennedy's vice president. Advice to any presidents out there, don't get a vice president with the last name Johnson. Anyway, Andrew Johnson hated the South. And due to Booth killing Lincoln, Johnson punished the South for the war. What Booth was trying to prevent from happening is what happened. And I see the similarities between that and what Oswald wanted. Now, regarding the conspiracies, I do have to put in a quote from my favorite YouTuber, Wendigoon here. Yeah, you know what? Roll it. And remember, kids, the next time that somebody tells you the government wouldn't do that, oh, yes, they would. Now, I want to give a massive shout out to the 6-4 Museum. They have an abundance of resources that are just amazing. They, they have an interactive motorcade map. They have an interactive timeline that goes all the way back to when JFK was born and shows everything that happened in his life that led up to Dallas. Also, I highly, highly recommend you check out Lamino's. I think, I think that's how you say his channel name. I'm not sure. Check out Lamino's uh, YouTube video on Lee Harvey Oswald and his movements within the Texas School Book Depository because that video is amazing. And it really just focuses on how, if this was a conspiracy and someone hired Oswald to kill the president or it was the CIA or whatever, they did a terrible job. Did they kill the president? Yes, but they could have done it so much better. And I mean that in the nicest way. Also, like I mentioned before, check out Caitlin Daughtry. Daughtry? Daughtry? I'm sorry if I said your name wrong. Check out her video on JFK's body and all that. She's an amazing content creator as well. Love her. Um, just awesome video. Also, check out Wendigoon's um, JFK conspiracy videos. I think he has multiple, but yeah, check them out. They are awesome. It's kind of what got me like inspired me to make this video. So thank you, Wendigoon. You're awesome. And finally, the 2013 movie Parkland, which is about JFK's time at Parkland after he shot and declared dead, is an amazing film. They go into everything. They go into the capture of Oswald. They go into the procurement of the Zapruder film. Amazing film. Check it out. And thank you so much for watching. If you made it this far, I appreciate you. You are amazing. If you liked the video, give me a like. If you didn't like it, give me a dislike. Go to the comments. Tell me, what do you think happened to JFK? Was he assassin? I mean, okay, well, he was assassinated, but was there a conspiracy behind it? Was it just a lone gunman? Was it the government? What do you think? Also, consider subscribing. This is my first video. I've uploaded a lot of shorts in the past. 
but I really want to get into this long form content and I would love for you to subscribe and yeah, thank you so much again for watching and peace.